Um, can we start off by introducing our panelists? We have Dr. Anne Delevey, uh, Dr. Jim Delini, Dr. Skipper, Dr. Davis, and myself. Uh, this is the ME407 Preliminary Design of Robotic Systems um, presentation. We have two groups today. Uh, this is the first group that's presented, and they will talk about their uh, robotic code. So I'll uh, turn it over to Logan, and we can get started. Hello, everybody. Um, we are Narwhal Robotics. Uh, I'm Logan McDonald, team lead. Right here is Yanni Todd. And over there is Lashin Akankula. And right next to him is Sylvia Vijay. Okay. So, the purpose of our robot is to basically clean up algae out of uh, Watson Lake. Now, algae is a big problem in this lake. There's been a a lot of uh, it's uh, a nuisance to recreational activities. The algae gets clogged up in propellers. The uh, overall, it's been a big problem for them. So we decided that it would be a great idea to come up with a robot that would clean algae out of the lake, and that's where Narwhal comes. Uh, it's worth noting Narwhal stands as an acronym. It stands for Navigating Autonomous Robot, which handles the water So, first I'll go over the outline of this presentation. First, we'll talk about the requirements, and then we'll go into the physical, uh, electrical, software design. And then I'll introduce the dynamic model we use for our algorithm. I'll introduce some simulations we did in that lab. Finally, we'll go over the budget, uh, the Gantt chart for next semester, and end it all, or conclude it all with a conclusion. So now I'm going to pass it over to Yanni, and she's going to talk about the requirements, specifications, and what Thank you, Logan. Um, as part of my contribution to this presentation, like Logan mentioned, I'm going to be covering the requirements and specifications we came up with, as well as the physical design of the robot. We divided normal into five main subsystems. We have the body subsystem, waste storage, propulsion, electrical, and software. So let's first go over the requirements for the first subsystem. For the body subsystem, it's really important for us that our robot is water resistant and that all the materials in the robot are resistant to corrosion. Why? Because our robot is going to be in the lake for the majority of its life. In addition, we want our robot to have a, an overall safe and eco-friendly design. Why? Because we want to protect the robot itself, we want to protect any wildlife that may come in contact with the robot, and we don't want to pollute the lake any further. Additionally, we want the robot to be stable when navigating, and most importantly, we want this robot to float on the surface. For the next subsystem, the waste storage subsystem, we have two main requirements. We must collect and filter algae from the lake, and we want once we have collected this algae, we want to be able to dispose of it effectively. For the next subsystem, the propulsion subsystem, our main requirement is that we want to navigate at a reasonable speed. For the electrical subsystem, we have four main requirements. We want to have simplistic circuitry. We want to have low consumption components. We want to have a long battery life. And we want to know when the battery is running low. And lastly, for the software subsystem, we want to keep a safe distance from the shore. We want to have autonomous capabilities. And we want to have localization or more. And that covers all the requirements. And now just as each subsystem has requirements, each requirement has a corresponding specification that now I'm going to go over. So for the first subsystem, I talked about being water resistant. The way we're going to test that is we're going to grab a robot and we're going to submerge it one foot under the surface of the water. And we're going to test to see if any water goes inside the boxes, like the electronic boxes, the, the motor boxes. Um, if the robot is able to keep the water um, from going into the boxes, that means that when the robot is completely in the surface of the water, on the surface of the water, it's completely waterproof. We also talked about uh, being rust resistant. We did a little bit of research, and most materials have an average corrosion rate of 150 mil inches per year. So the materials we test, uh, we use, uh, must have a corrosion rate less than 150 mil inches per year. We also did one of the 
materials to degrade more less than four, I'm sorry more than four percent over the course of a week. Um, we we talked about safety. Um, there are rounded edges throughout the surface of a robot, so we want to limit the fillet radius to a minimum of one sixteenth of an inch. Um, we talked about stability again, and how do we test stability? We disturb the system, right? So. We want our robot to be stable, even if we place a weight equivalent to 25% of it, 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 its entire weight to one side, either the right side or the left side. We still want to be stable. Um, we want to limit the waste storage volume that we can take to 2,500 cubic inches. I think currently our design is about 1,555 cubic inches. For the next subsystem, the waste storage, we talked about two main requirements. We want to be able to collect it filter algae. So um, our collection mechanism, the specification is that it must go two inches below the surface of the water. At all times, we want to be able to collect at least 0.1 pounds per hour. And um, we want to collect, we want to be able to hold at least 80% of the algae we collect. And we determine that the appropriate mesh, mesh size for that volume that we want to keep would be about 30 openings per, per inch. Um, we talked about as well about um, disposing of the waste effectively, and that is that it should not take us longer than 15 minutes to grab the box, dispose of the algae, and put it back. For the next subsystem, the propulsion, we talked about reasonable speed. To us, a reasonable speed is at least one mile per hour and a maximum speed of four miles per hour. And um, the specifications for the electrical and software subsystems will later be covered by Sylvia and Ashley in this presentation. So now, let's talk about the fun stuff. Who wants to look at the design of the robot? I do. So I thought you as an audience would appreciate seeing previous designs of our robot, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you two major designs our robot um, went through in order to get to its final design. It's important to know that the three designs you'll see today have pretty much the overall same dimensions. The only part that changed drastically from one design to the other was the collection mechanism. So let's first look at the first one. This is um, the first design, major design we came up with. Can you guys see the pointer? No? In the back? Okay. Um, like I said, um, all three designs have the main float, the storage float, the, the, battery, bo the battery box, the waste storage box. The, the key feature of this design is this one right here. Um, we discarded this design because we felt um, we didn't like two things. The number one thing is that this design only goes forward and slows down. It doesn't have a steering um, capability. And also, we kind of felt, we felt that we could collect algae more effectively, we need to collect one algae. So we moved on to brainstorming a little bit more, and we thought about having a rotation mechanism that would serve as the propulsion as well as collection mechanism, like a paddle wheel. And with that rotation in mind, we said, what about a conveyor belt? And that's when design number two came to life. And again, you can still see um, the storage flow, the main storage flow sitting in the front, all the boxes, all the boxes, the key feature here, again, is the conveyor belt. And you can see it right here. Um, the conveyor belt had evenly spaced buckets, that's how we call them, and they had mesh walls, so the, uh, the water could drain back into the lake, and we could still keep the algae, it, the buckets would go to the top, and then the space of the algae. And also, this design had a rudder, which we did not have in the previous design. And um, we were still not convinced on the design, and we kept talking about this, and we came up with the third design. I'm going to be wearing new features. Uh, we still have the floats I previously, previously, previously stated, the main floor, the storage floor, some of the electronic boxes, the motor boxes. But this design that you guys are about to see has a pair of paddle wheels, and it has on our bikini screw. So here's a side view of the robot. Um, you can see this round circle right there, that's the paddle wheel. We have the, the battery box, the waste storage 
bogs, the secondary float, the main float, and you can see a side view of their feeding us through on the far right. Let me show you now an isometric view of the robot. And here it is. I like this view because you guys can see at the bottom of the box, there is the mesh screen I was talking about earlier. So once the algae goes to the top, comes down into the box, water goes back into the lake, and we just keep doing this over and over. And that concludes my section of the presentation. Now I'm gonna hand the floor over to Sylvia. Thank you, Yanni. As Yanni said, I'm Sylvia Villegas, and I'm going to be covering the electrical design, which includes the electrical block diagram, the components, the schematic, and how these specifications are met. So first, if you draw your attention to the right, here is an electrical block, um, block diagram of each individual component, which I will describe in the next couple of slides individually. First, we start with the ultrasonic sensor. This is just meant for uh, for the robot to avoid any obstacles as it's navigating in the lake. So when it comes across a, a let's say a wall or a boat coming near it, it's going to be able to, the ultrasonic sensor is going to be able to scan hit this area and see the obstacle and turn at a random angle and completely avoid that obstacle, which will be covered later on in the software. Here we have, we're also using a digital servo, which is just meant to control the angular or linear position of the ultrasonic sensor. We also implemented uh, two gear motors, which are meant to control the speed of our path views. Additionally, we also have uh, an individual gear motor just to control the speed of our views. The voltage regulator is just meant to regulate the voltage being transmitted to a certain component. So if we see here, let's say the microcontroller needs five volts, the voltage regulator is, is able to just give it that amount of voltage and no more. We also implemented a GPS. This is just meant for the robot to be, we not only want to know where the robot is in the lake, but we also want the robot to know where it is in the lake. That way, it is able to come back to shore and recharge. Um, there's also a compass, which just determines the direction the robot is facing, whether it be north, south, east, west, and it'll be able to determine that and come back to shore. The accelerometer is just meant for us to know, just to keep track of how fast or slow the robot is going. We, as Yanni stated before, we want our robot to go in between one mile per hour and four miles per hour. We don't want it to go too slow or too fast. So we would be able to keep, that, keep track of it. So we added three motor drivers for each gear motor. Since we know that the microcontroller can't directly control the speed of the motors, we added a motor driver which is used to control the speed of the motors through a full swing modulation of PWM, which is sent from which is a signal sent from a microcontroller. As, as any type of robot, it needs some kind of rain. So as humans, we have a rain, and it is able to send signals throughout our body. We want that same mechanism for our robot. We want it to be able to send those signals to each electrical component and do that same concept. And lastly, we also included a group of lasers and a cadmium sulfite cell, which essentially acts as like a sensor to detect when our waste storage box is filled with algae. So once the laser it is blocked by the algae, it is able to, it, the resistance decreases. And that is a way for us to know when I mean, the robot needs to come back to shore and dispose of that. This just shows an electrical schematic showing each component and what pin it will be connected to the microcontroller. As you can see in the middle, uh, we have three motor drivers and we have a PWM for each one which will be connected.
connected to the plant controller in order to communicate and control the system. Lastly, the specifications. So the, our, we wanted our robot to have an operational life of at least three hours, traveling at one mile per hour. We also said no custom made circuit board. This allows us to keep for easy troubleshooting and it just is easy for everyone to just fix it and replace it. And also the battery must be able to be removed in no less than 10 minutes. Any longer would just be too long. And now I will pass it on to, to Logan, actually. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the dynamic model, uh, the modes of operation that our robot uses in the algorithm, and also the sector database, which is uh, used in the algorithm as well. So right here, as you can see, we have a mathematical dynamic model of the robot. We included the forces generated by the paddle wheels with the X and Y acceleration components of the robot. And we also included linear drag for each component. And for the angular acceleration, we added the torque generated by the paddle wheels as well as the angular drag. So, modes of operation. So our robot operates off of seven different modes. And each one of these modes acts as a, uh, uh, almost it, it kind of tells the robot what it should do. Um, and these, these are all affected by the surroundings, if an obstacle is been detected, if uh, the battery is running low, the storage box is full, all these things affect what mode of operation the robot is going to run. So for the first mode of operation, we have move forward, very simple. Uh, the second one is turning away from the boundary, and the boundary being like the shoreline or somewhere where the robot came. Um, the third one, return home basically tells the robot that it's time to go home and should go back to wherever home is. The fourth one, it's worth mentioning that we currently haven't implemented this uh, or created this algorithm yet, but basically what it would do is it vectorize the movement of the robot so it can focus on a set area and just focus on collecting uh, algae in a set area. Um, the fifth mode is turn at a random angle. This is only activated for a short period of time, and it just adds some randomness to the move. And the sixth uh, mode is avoiding obstacles. This is a very important mode. Um, it does what it says, it avoids obstacles. The seventh mode is stop robot, and well, just like move forward, it's pretty simple. All it does is throw the motors in reverse, and until the the velocity of the robot has reached a certain limit. So, the sector database, this is kind of a tricky thing to explain, so bear with me. So, a sector is basically, we defined it as a square area on a map, and then we also defined a sector matrix as a matrix of sectors representing a map. And each one of these uh, sectors has a piece of information which represents something useful that the robot can read off. So on the picture on the right, it kind of shows you what a, the layout of a sector matrix might look like. And finally, the, the sector database is just the collection of all the sector matrices that we use. And we use two different types of sector matrices. The first one is sector type matrix. So this provides information about an area to the robot. This, this the uh, sector type associated with the sector can represent uh, can be five different things or six different things. Sorry. The first one it could be open water, which physically represents something like the middle of the lake, somewhere where there's not a lot of dynamic obstacles, such as boats. The first. Uh, sector type is the boundary, and that indicates that there's a shore, uh, there's land there, that there is shallow water. Anywhere where the robot can't go is indicated by uh, sector type 1. For sector type 2, which is the boundary border, it's simply a border that, uh, or 
boundary is boundary. And it basically tells the robot that it's getting close to the boundary and that it should prepare itself to turn around and get out of the way. And the third one is the home sector. And there's only one home sector in the, the whole matrix. And that is where the robot would go when it needs to be uh, retrieved or when the battery needs to be replaced and so on. The fourth sector type currently isn't implemented. It's shown in this picture, but in our map lab simulations, we didn't use it just because we haven't implemented mode four yet. And finally, the fifth type of sector is the caution sector. It's pretty much the same thing as open water physically, but it indicates to the robot that there is potential for mobile obstacles uh, to be in that area. So it should take caution and go a little bit slow. So the last sector uh, matrix that we had is the return home angle. So this basically tells the robot how it's going to get home. It reads the uh, return home angle value at the sector it's currently in. It goes in that direction. And no matter where on the lake it is, it will always get back home. So um, starting at any point, all the arrows lead back to the home sector. And this is just a way to easily uh, calculate how the robot's going to get home without having to do onboard calculations. All it has to do is read the database and it can figure out how to get home. And this is a bigger picture of it. And as you can see, every single arrow, every single arrow eventually leads back home. So no matter where the robot's at, it'll figure it out. And now I'm going to pass it over to Lashin, and he's going to talk about some words. Thank you, Lana. So I'll talk about software design, which includes uh, the flowchart of the algorithm used, the explanation of the projects used in the software algorithm, and I'll uh, specify the requirements needed for our design. Next. The next slide you'll see the general algorithm design using our code. So so as you see the robot starts its mission by initializing the variables, such as control, uh, navigation variable. Then, in proceeding to the position and velocity and position, after that it returns to the center. Then, updates server angle and ultrasonic sensor measurement. After that, it goes to the mode selection. And, as it was mentioned, there is seven modes where the mode 4 is not determined yet. After that, it goes to control and monitors and updating the velocities and loops back. So, let's talk about control. So, Control starts by um, checking the test controller. If it's equal to zero, it updates uh, uh, the speed to constant continuous speed. Otherwise, it checks if the test controller is equal to one. In case if the condition is true, it updates uh, uh, the linear speed and its angular velocity. And otherwise, it executes the control. The first mode is moving forward. So what it do is uh, checks uh, its updates its ultrasonic scanner angle and uh, its uh, specified controller to zero. And if 
the sector type is open water, it uh, specifies angular velocity to the maximum one, otherwise it goes to the uh, otherwise it checks the, the S the sector type is caution flow. If it's true, it's at least it's angular velocity to the uh, some constant times the maximum. In our case it's uh, half of the maximum angular velocity. And in both ways it executes the problem. Next one is a uh, turn away from boundary function. It is uh, one of the most important functions in our program. What we do it's finding the best center to go. If case is true, it determines the goal point and it's uh, uh, specifying the angular error and next it specifies controller to one and it also specifies the angular velocities and angular and linear speed to the certain one. If case is false, uh, it goes and checks the distances and angles, assigns the weight to each mode, uh, to each center, and choose the best vector to go. Otherwise, it's executed uh, to the determined goal point. If sector, and then it checks if sector type is of open water or uh, caution zone, it's uh, proceeding to the mode 5 and executes the program. Otherwise, if case is false, it just executes the program. The home sector section is a really short one. It uh, checks what the sector is. Uh, if the sector angle is zero, it goes uh, and specifies the controller to zero and angular velocity to zero, uh, which means it stops. Otherwise, uh, I mean, then it proceeds to the task of uh, sensor time, and in cases it's uh, not equal to the three, which is caution zone, then it displays uh, the error robot boundary. Otherwise, it updates the goal point and uh, specifies the variables as controller, linear speed, and uh, linear angular velocity. So the fifth form is the turn random angle function. It finds the random angle and updates the set <coughs> angular error and checks if the angular sector is uh, small. Uh, it proceeding to the mode one, which is moving forward, and executes the function. Otherwise, it just executes the function. As was mentioned uh, by Logan, uh, the obstacle avoidance algorithm is pretty really easy. So, first of all, it's asking scan is completed. If yes, then it scores the personal angle and updates the controller uh, and executes the program. Otherwise, it's analyzing the ultrasonic data and find the edges in that uh, collected data. Find the largest open area and uh, setting the goal orientation between the two edges and if it's continuous, it's saying that the analyzing the data is done and it executes. We specifically um, designed two subnodes for the obstacle avoidance machine. Uh, if it's subnode equal one, if it's true, it's uh, uh, <coughs> turning in the place. 
Otherwise, uh, in the proceeding and checking if the angular error and velocity is small, it's uh, updating to the next mode. I mean, uh, specifies the next mode. And otherwise, it's taking to use. And lastly, suppose two uh, checks if it's true or false. If it's true, then the timer exceeds the specified time even for that mode. And it's updated to the mode seven, mode seven which is stops robot. And uh, otherwise, it's just executes the program. Oh. Otherwise, it's uh, updating the controller to zero, which is uh, co uh, constant to linear speed of the robot. And the angular velocity becomes uh, the maximum. And otherwise, it's continuous. So, stop function is pretty really easy. It's uh, checked, I mean, it's uh, specifies controller to zero. And it's uh, decelerating the robot and asking if the robot is stopped. If yes, it goes to back to the obstacle when it's operating. Otherwise, it executes the program. I'll go, I'll go over software design specifications listed here. The first one the robot must not go to the water, must not go in water. Uh, that is less than 4 feet deep. Next one, it should keep uh, 20 feet away from the shore while collecting algae. Uh, the third one is the uh, robot must be able to operate autonomously 75% of the uh, robot life. And the last thing is the robot must always arrive at the boat ramp at 30 minutes of the life of the Now I'll pass it to Logan. Thank you. So now I'm going to go over simulations and everything else in the simulation. But first, I have a video of the simulation. So you can see how much.
rhythm is, it, at no point does it get very close to the uh, any of the obstacles. And kind of gets trapped. But this isn't really this obstacle layout isn't common anyway. You don't know, see this as common. Uh, and so this is uh, a plot showing how the robot turns away from the boundary. So we have the boundary border right here in this gray area. You can't see the boundary because it's way over here. So the robot's going forward, and as soon as it determines it's in this gray area, it switches mode to determine the best sector for the, to move to, which is over here. And then it turns towards it. Now, the randomness of the colors, how the, the modes are switching on and like back and forth, really quickly got through the GPS inaccuracies. So, that's, that's why that's like that. And finally, we have a plot showing how the robot returns home. So, you haven't seen the uh, return home angle sector matrix for this yet, but basically it's all pointing towards home, like I said before. And the robot determines that angle, it moves in that direction, and it, it sees an obstacle that takes precedence over the direction it's moving in, so it will avoid the obstacle, and it stops once it gets back home. Simple as that. And so our budget, uh, it's worth it. I'm not gonna go over all these things because that would take too long. So our total budget, or our budget is $500 and our total cost uh, was $538. So it exceeded the, uh, our budget by $38. However, we're still waiting on Lowe's to return back to us to see if they will sponsor us. And they seem pretty interested, so fingers crossed. <laughs> and once they, uh, once uh, they agree, Total cost will go down to 365. They're not paying us, but they're basically giving us the stuff we need. So that's all. And finally, we have a uh, Gantt chart of what we're, what we're planning on doing next semester in detail. So we decided that 16 days was a good amount of time to build, to build a robot, and with everything already available and stuff like that. So we gave us 50 days to develop the software, and that includes writing the software, debugging it, figuring out what's wrong with it, and all that good stuff. And I, we gave ourselves 23 days to do experiments, which are to test the specification, test if we meet the specifications, um, and also collecting GPS data and anything we need to write the software. And lastly, we gave ourselves 68 days for testing, which includes testing on the lake itself, <coughs> further, more debugging, basically, um, testing each mode, and finally, fine tuning. And that concludes our presentation. So, overall, our robot is designed to collect algae off, uh, out from Lake Watson. It's, uh, the control system is pretty robust, in my opinion. And that's about it. Questions? Did you say the robot's going to be submerged two inches? I didn't understand the two inch. I didn't answer that. Um, the robot is operating on the surface of the water all the time. But we want to make sure it's waterproofed, and the way we're going to test that is we're going to submerge it one foot under the surface to see if the water is not going inside the boxes. I thought How I heard two inches. That's oh no, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking. I'm sorry. I thought you were asking about the one foot. No. Um. If I may go back to the slide. Oh, your question. So the requirement is that this bottom edge of the collection mechanism has to go at least two inches below oh, okay. the surface of the water. Okay. Does that answer your question? <coughs> Thank you.
working in this group. Can you give me a rundown on how that works? Okay. Um, so this thing isn't totally enclosed. We have an open area uh, on the top. And this thing spins like this. And you kind of have this uh, bottom area right here. And as it's spinning, it basically elevates the water. It moves the water up the screw. And once it gets to the very end, the water and algae drops down. So it's, um, <coughs> it's a way that. So it's, it's spinning fast enough that the water is actually going up the water. It doesn't have to spin fast. It can spin slow. It's gravity, gravity keeps the water inside of this. It's, it's like kind of like Size. Now, if it's really too big, a big box floating, 
won't ever get close to that, okay? So <laughs> that was one. Um, the other I had is, how would you check underwater if there is any reef or anything below? Um, I, I looked up uh, underwater kind of mesh sensors, basically it sends uh, distance underwater and they're kind of expensive. So we decided to go with the sector matrix and basically we'd have, there's a topography map, underwater topography, topography map online, uh, some pretty good ones too, and we plan on using that to define where the robot can go and we avoid the shallow for rocks under the water. that suggested you had actually determined how long this thing would run on the battery. 
So do you have any confidence that you will achieve your requirements given the motors you've selected in the batteries? Yes. Uh, so we didn't include it in the slide because we felt like the algorithm was going to take a long time to explain the partition. Uh, but basically we calculated what we thought the microcontroller would draw and then we gave, uh, we calculated if, if you don't have those calculations to show today, let's just move on. Okay. But you should have those calculations to show in this presentation. Okay. okay? Um, and then the next thing, uh, I have concern about the resiliency of the system. Uh, we, the discussion with GPS, what is your system going to do if the GPS fails? So I, I commend you for, for measuring the inaccuracies, measuring variability. But what happens if your GPS is out of service altogether? Um. Well, we had a couple ideas actually, like what would happen, what would we do if something went wrong. Uh, one idea was to send basically a signal out to somebody that, a technician of some sort, and they would get the signal and basically tell the technician that, oh, something's wrong with the robot, we need to go retrieve it. Otherwise, it's possible, I haven't tested it in a simulation yet, but it's possible if you take the GPS out that it could just use uh, the ultrasonic sensor to avoid the obstacles. It wouldn't know where to go um, in terms of how to get back to the boat ramp, which is the home sector. And it might accidentally uh, go into shallow water and get stuff. So I, I think you have two susceptibilities here. One is GPS failure. The other wheel is a pedal. And the other issue is the paddle wheel being jammed due to debris. And either one of those, and I believe you're dead in the water. Yes. And so you want to look at how are you resilient to those faults, because they will occur. Okay. Excuse me, Mike. Uh, using two systems, uh, which one do you have accelerometers, you have GPS. So once the GPS is working, and we know the GPS is working, you might use that. So if GPS for any reason fails, and you can detect that the GPS fails, you might just do the reckoning and mute your uh, accelerometer for a while. It will drift very badly if GPS is not there. But at least uh, uh, by the time that you can get it to the home point or any search point, maybe it will be. Oh, Dr. Davis, just to add to you the, previous, the first question that you Expense for PCBs, for circuit boards. Yes, you They do circuit boards? Oh, it's your favorite. Okay. Print a circuit board. Okay. PVC. What did I say? PVC? What are the specific? No custom PCBs. That's my next question. So, yeah, my follow up question would be slide 33. So it doesn't list the expense for PCB on um, slide 59. Uh, no custom made circuit boards. Is that really a specification? Or is that a goal, a, a budget goal? Kind of. How do you, how do you know that? Uh, we're not sure, but we want to try to stick with buying uh, off, the shelf. off the shelf circuit boards rather than manually having to go in the lab and print on the circuit board ourselves, which would take a lot of time. And also, since it's, all, it's always going to be in the lake, there's not going to be an engineer there to physically troubleshoot the circuit board. So we want it to be, so let's say if it's a maintenance person, we want it to be able to be easy for them. Like, 
You're saying you're the ML 128? Yes. Um, what kind of database do you plan on using? Do you have a design desktop that bridge yet? No. Okay. Um, go for the questions. Thank you. Hi, um, so I just want to say, great presentation. I've never heard of this project. This is really cool. It's really fascinating, to be honest. I'm really excited for you guys. Um, if I may, I would like to share a few recommendations on presenting. Um, so uh, the first one was for the screw, uh, as Dr. Shepard mentioned. It would be great if you could put like, another slide describing more how the screw works. So like for me personally, I had an idea of my own, like how it could be working. But if you could obviously have another slide showing Here's a close up on how the screw would collect the um, algae. That'd be great. Another one is um, with the dimensions of the robot. I don't know, did you guys design that in Katia or did you, how did you get that? SolidWorks. SolidWorks? Okay, so SolidWorks has a way of presenting like uh, blueprints, if you will. Oh, yeah. That'd yeah, be a good yeah, idea to show and have the dimensions in there. Um, another one was in the beginning, so I, I guess we had technical difficulties with the laser pointer, and so you guys referred it to the uh, yardstick. Um, that's all right, but I would not recommend doing that next term in detail. Do not use a yardstick. Your laser pointer should be working by then. Um, because the yardstick was great in directing the audience's attention to like certain locations you're speaking to, but at some points it got left in the hand and it was just waving around while you guys were talking, and it was kind of a distraction. So don't use a yardstick in the detail uh, presentation if you can. Additionally, I don't know if you guys are presenting here for detail next term, but if you are, don't stay in that corner because sitting back here, you're hidden behind that speaker and I can't see you at all. Plus the feedback. So if you could, um, so I think the best recommendation is just to practice standing in certain locations and walking back and forth and just staying in that one spot and not like running to each other, don't be switching around. Don't spread out too far either because now you're out of like my view and it's like you guys are too like spread out. Those are my only uh, recommendations I'd like to share with you. Hopefully it can help you guys. But overall, I'm really excited to see where this goes next year. Good job. <laughs>